Good afternoon. So we'll start our uh, lecture today. Um, as uh, usual, we remind you with the um, topic from uh, previous lectures. We discuss uh, polymorphisms, and we saw how it's uh, powerful uh, tools uh, with the Java and um, inheritance. And also, we uh, talk about design by contract in view of inheritance, and we saw that how the effect of preconditions and postcondition with the inheritance, if we have a precondition and postcondition for a method inside the superclass, and we extend this class, and we need to override this method, and what we should do in terms of precondition and postconditions. And also, we discuss in details the static fields and static methods, and how they are interact with them. Inheritance. If we have a static field and static method, how the inheritance we affect these static field and static method, and we saw if we need to count the number of created employee, and we have only one copy of the static fields, and we increment the static fields from the constructor of the employee, and if we extend the employee to create a manager, so inside the manager, we don't need to increment this counter anymore because we call the super constructor of the employee where the super constructor of the employee increment the static field. And static method is uh, one copy of this method and we discuss the effect of late bindings and static bindings. We say that when we have a private fields, private methods, static fields, static methods, final fields, Final methods, these are already defined with the object at the compiled time. There is no late binding or dynamic dispatch with the private and final and static. So that was last lectures. Today we will discuss one of the interesting topics, uh, it's computational complexity. We're going to discuss the computational complexity. Normally, if you go to the literatures or you see some books, they discuss the computational complexity from two point of view, the time and the memory, which is the resources and the space. You can say time and space. If you run the algorithms, how much time it will take to finish and how many memory you need to finish the task. Uh, today, actually, we're going to focus on the time. We're not going to discuss the memory and the space that we need to run the algorithms. We're going to discuss the time, how many time and how many elementary instructions. We can introduce that elementary instructions term. And also big O notions, okay? And what is the big O notations and what we mean by that. And also we're going to discuss some common category from big O. Now we will review in uh, the first slide some mathematics uh, formulas and some mathematical definitions that you already know. So if we have log written on the slide, so what do we mean by that? Log to the base 2, not log to the base 10. So log to the base 2. So if we have uh, log x to the base 2, we mean by that x is equal 2 to the power y. So if you take a log of x, that will equal to y. So always the base for the log, if we didn't mention that, it should be clear for all of us, it's base 2. So x is equal 2 to the power y, which is the exponent, and you know from the mathematics that the exponent and the log are inverse for each other. So log x to the base 2 is equal to y. In other words, it means x is equal to 2 to the power y. Now, log of 2 to 1 million, which is around less than 20, okay? That is the power of log. That is always to keep in mind that exponent grow very, very quickly while logarithm grow very slowly, okay? So logarithm and exponent are inverse to each other. So exponent grow very fast while logarithm or log grow very slow. And this figure show you what is the difference between even linear growing, like 
n function of n, like f of n, where is, is, if the n is equal to 1, then f of n is equal to 1, 2 is equal to 2, and that what I mean by blue line here in the figure. And also, the green one is log of n. You can see the log of n is very slow compared even to the n, which is the linear growth. Now, if you would try to take a log of a times p, that is equivalent to log a plus log p. If you take log of n to the power k, which is equivalent to k times log to the power n. Now, this is equal sign. So if even if you see inside the equation log of a minus log of p, that is mean is log of a divided by p. Numerator minus the denominators. Now, log of, log of x, which is means log of log of x, that is very, very slow functions, growing very slow, which is equivalent to double exponent, 2 to the power 2 to the power x. Okay? Now, this is different from the previous one, log of x times log of x. This is log of x squared, okay? which is log square of x. That's what we, the notation we use in the red. This is a, a greater than log of x for all x is greater than 2. Now, another two important function we're going to use is the floor and ceiling. So the floor of x is the first integer less than x, okay? Or you can say the largest integer not greater than x. And ceiling is the first integer greater than x, which is the smallest integer not less than x. So, having all these definitions with us, we can start talking about computational complexity. Normally, uh, computational complexity related to the resources. And as we mentioned in the beginning, in this course, we're going to focus on the time resources. How many time you need to run your algorithms. And Normally, time complexity measured based on the size of the input. We have n, where n is the size of the problem. And the size of the problem is determined by looking to the size of the input arguments. Okay? So if you create an algorithm that's going to work on an array to sort an array, you have unsorted array, so you want to sort it, so you create an algorithm, then you need to sort this array. How much size of this array? So the time complexity that we're going to today do, it's related to the size of the input. N where is always indicate the size of the input. If this clear, so always N is not negative. No one can say the size of the problem is minus 2. Okay? You can have the size of the problem is 0, we run for empty string, for example. You try to shuffle empty string, okay? But always n is greater than zero, okay? Always non-negative because we are, taking to, we are talking about the size of the input that we're going to run the algorithms. In the real world, it's very interesting that we can say an implementation A for the same problem is faster than the implementation P. So two students, they create an algorithm to sort unsorted array. So one of them take 10 minutes to sort it. Other one take five minutes to sort it. Okay? Then you have to give a reward. Okay? And even sometimes you see in the news some kind of competition between the programmers where they have to write the program very fast. Now, with a lot of difference in resources, parallelisms, okay, multi-threading, all these should be taken care of that process of finding the time or calculating the complexity of the time. Here in this class, we're not going to talk about the real value of the run of the algorithm by taking time, okay? We're going to talk about more like an abstract idea how much the complexity of the algorithm. Let us see. So most of the algorithm actually 
transfer, you can think about them as a process that take the input data and transfer them to the an output. For example, you have input as an array, unsorted array. You feed it to an algorithm. This algorithm receives this unsorted array as an input and produce the output. The output is another sorted array. Okay? So the running time of the algorithm is typically grow with the size of the input. If the, you receive 10 elements to sort them, okay, you will take time more than if you receive two elements to sort them. Okay? So the time complexity of the algorithm related to the size of the input. So we're going to try to analyze the time as a function of the input size. Now, let us take this example for this lectures and try to make the projections of all the ideas how we can calculate the time complexity of an algorithm. Then later on, if I give you any other algorithms or any other methods, you can do it. Okay? So we're going to today take this example and analyze it step by step. This analyzation is not for this problem in specific. You can take the same step and apply it for any arbitrary method. Okay? So the ABI is given to us, and we have this static method called contains. It receives an input as an array and integer value. We try to find the value inside this array. So we're going to search inside this array to find the value. The very simple implementation we have here in this slide. For integer i is equal to 0, for i less than the length of the array, we're going to increment the counter. We're going to look. If the element that currently we are pointing to is equal to the value, we're going to return true and we break out. No more looking. We find what we are looking for, the value. If else, we have to keep looking for all the elements. If we finish the length of the element or the input array and we couldn't find the element we look for, we're going to retain the false to the user. So the size of the problem n is the number of elements inside this array. Now we estimate the time complexity of the algorithms. So the basic thing is for each line of the code, we estimate the number of elementary instructions. This is a new term. What is mean by elementary instructions? For each line of code, we're going to determine how often this line is going to be executed. There, we're going to calculate the total by identifying how many elementary operations per line, each line, how much often will be executed. Then, we multiply these two numbers together to calculate the total number of elementary instructions. What is elementary instructions? Elementary instructions, for the purpose of this course, we define the elementary instructions for all instructions that need a constant amount of time. These all are considered as elementary instructions. Declaring a variable, consider an elementary instruction as a step. Need a time to declare the variable. Make assignment equal for the variable. Arithmetic, addition, subtraction, multiplications, divisions, remainders, all these are considered as an elementary instructions. Comparison, greater than, less than, equal, not equal, Boolean expressions, and or negations, if else statement, all the if, if else statements considered as one elementary instruction. Array access, if you want to read element from the array, this considered as one elementary instructions. Retain a statement, consider as elementary instructions. So these are considered as elementary instructions for our course. Now, actually in reality, if we look at the for loop, we're going to consider the for loop as one elementary instruction. But actually, for loop contains initializations and checking the conditions and also increment the conditions. Okay? So in reality, this is not a, a, an elementary operation, but for purpose for our consideration, we're going to consider for loop as one elementary instructions. Okay? 
Now, let us go back to our example and count how many elementary instructions we have in this method. How many ins elementary instructions? Okay. I would like you to follow with me step by step. It's very important. If you don't want to do it, it's your choice. I will give you half a minute. Take a piece, pencil, and paper, and try to write how many elementary instructions for each line. Okay? You don't want to do it. It's your choice. I'm going to you, give you half a minute. Do it. So let us go with this example. Yes. Excuse me. Unknown. We are doing, let's assume the size of array is n. Or if I get, tell you the array size is 4 or 5. We need to calculate the time complexity of this for this any size. Okay? In terms of the size of the input, we're going to retain a function. That in terms of the size of the input, n. N here is the size of the input. Okay? If this array was two elements, just take N and put two. Then I give you time complexity. Okay? So how many elements inside array is not important now. You can calculate the time complexity of this method in terms of the size of the input. Yes? We're going to discuss this later on. But now, after we define the elementary operation, these are the elementary operation. Look at each line on the method and say how many elementary operation you see. Okay? Then we're going to come discuss the situation of worst case, best case, average case later on. Okay? Let us now focus on this step because there's a three steps to calculate the time complexity of any algorithms. Determine how many elementary operations you have, how many times this elementary operation will run, then multiply them together to calculate the total time complexity. Okay, so let us start. We have two elementary operations in this line. Declare and assign. We declare result and assign the result. How we have only one elementary operation because we say that for loop, we're going to consider it as one elementary operation. We have a three elementary operation on this line because we have to access the RAM. I mean, we have to access the array. We have to compare. And then we have if statement. So we have three elementary operations. In this line, we have only one. The result is already declared, so just we assign one for a break and one for return. So these are the elementary operation in this method. It's an instruction. We need to run it. Yeah? One time, you're going to break. If you find the value, you're going to break, yes? So you need time to run the break from the loop. Yes. No, we consider, I told you, we, we ha have a separate slide to talk about for loop. All the students get confused about the for loop. We're going to consider the for loop for simplicity. Yes, you can do count how many elementary operations inside the for loop. We declare i. We make a sign i. Then we access the array. We make comparison of the array. We increment i. Maybe you get five or six elementary operations. But for simplicity, I'm going to tell you, whenever you see for loop, just put one elementary operation. Okay? Let us now, the second step, look at each line and determine how often this line is going to be executed. So this is line line. Take half a minute and to look at this line and say how many time the first line will be executed. How many times? Okay? Write that in your paper. Okay, so let us see. This line will be executed only once. 
this line will be executed only once yeah but this line will be executed up to n yes up to n because we have to go inside the loop okay and we check the element we bring the element we check the value of the element up to n yes it, you could look for a value that is actually is not exist inside the array so up to n might be lucky from one element you compare you find it but for the purpose of calculating the time complexity this if statement will be executed up to n okay you might lucky but after three comparison you find the element but up to n we're going to execute it yes No, up to n. Because if you calculate from 0 to n minus 1, how many number here? n. If you take from 0 to n, that's n plus 1. OK? OK? So we are calculating up to n, because the length of the size of the input is n. It's true up to 1, because once we find the element, we're going to retain true or assign true only once. Here, break only up to 1, only one time if we find the element. Also, this will be 1. So now, we determine how often each line will be executed. Do you have any question? Yes. We're going to consider this as a 1. OK? You can consider up to n. We'll not change anything. OK? We'll not change anything for, for loop. For loop is in real life is very complicated. I want to simplify the job for you. That's why I told you for the for loop, one elemented operations and gonna be executed only once. If you wanna put it in, after the end of the slide today, you're gonna see this will not make any difference. Yes. We are not, it's up to n. If we find many elements, the first occurrence, we're going to retain it, OK? It doesn't matter. If it's, there is a duplicate element inside the array, the same value we are looking for is exist many times, we are looking the first occurrence, OK? Good? So here we are not talking about the specific scenarios. We are looking at that. That's why it's a big O. It's like an abstract about the calculating the time complexity of this algorithm, OK? As function of the size of the input, okay? And again, back to his questions. If I consider the for loop up to n, or I consider it one, will not make a difference at the end today. You're going to see that, okay? Any other questions? Yes. You might not going to break, because you might not finding the element at all. So up to one. You might run a break statement, might be run zero. Nobody going to read the break. Because you might look inside that array. You couldn't find the element that you are looking for. So you're going to retain result. But for sure, you're going to retain result. Result will run only once, OK? Now is the third step. So three steps. If you have such kind of problem in the exam, you have to do these three steps. You are able to do these th three steps correctly you will be able to figure out the time complexity of any method. Now, we have to look at the total number. So, let us assume if something is going to run up to n, it will actually run up to n. That's the worst case, yes? The worst case scenario that we will have. So, we will multiply the number of elementary operations by the number of times each elementary operation is going to run. So, start. 2 times 1. 1 times 1. 3 times n, 1 times 1, 1 times 1, and 1 times 1. Let us add them all together. That will end as 3n plus 6. So this is the function. That's the functions. We end up f of n, which is n here, is the size of the input. So we are able to translate all this method, contains method, to a function in terms of time complexity and we are able to write it in terms of the size of the input. So now n is the size of the array. If the size of the array is a 3, 
tick n and put in array. It's a function like a math, like in the high school or calculus. This is a function. f of n is equal to 3n plus 6. You can draw it even. Yeah? Now, as a, the previous discussion, I would like you to take one minute and give me the f of n for each of these loops. Because always the loop confuses the student. That's why I bring this slide to see if really we look at the loop and we catch the point. Now, we have one, first one is the loop for n, then two and three. So please take a minute, take a minute, seriously, take a minute and try to do it, okay? That's the problem here. Uh, I was a student like you. When I look at the solution, everything is easy. I can get 100 out of 100. But when I try to do my homework, how I should start? Even I, how to put the pencil and paper on the table. It should be in this angle or this angle, or should I hold the pen like this or what? It's all these decisions. By practicing, you remove all these overhead, and you will save your time on the exam. Okay? Final exam will be written, not a computer. And most of you saw the difficulty when you go to the lab, test zero, lab test one, lab test two, when you are sitting on the front of the machine, you normally you are doing the labs on your laptops, you do everything smoothly, but now you're sitting on the chair, my, the chair is not comfortable, okay? The keyboard is still not like, you like it, like the keyboard on the, on the laptop. So practice now, take a pencil and paper, try to do the time complexity for this. Okay, so what about the first one? N, f of n, yes? C constant, some C constant times n. So a function of n here is n. What about the second one? N squared, that's right. What about the third one? You have now to remember the discrete map. Because the far outer loop is run from up to n the inner loop is run up to i. So you pick i in the, from outer loop, you put it as a limit for the inner loop. That will be c times 1 plus 2 plus up to n, and this is a very famous formula, and the summation for this formula is n times n plus 1 over 2. Well, that means c over 2, which is a constant, times n squared plus n, okay? What about this one? A method, let's say, an abstract method has some statement one, two, and three, so three statements. Then we have up to n capital here. Here we have three n because we have three statements inside the for loop. So totally we add them all together. That will end four n plus three. That's the time complexity for this method, example two. Now what about this example three? Take half a minute and figure out what is should be the f of n? We have three for loops. So there are nested for loop in the beginning, two nested for loops in the beginning, and there was one for loop not independent from the previous two. Yes? So the two nested for loops, we're going to multiply. But the one on that, we're going to add. So yes? So this is n squared. And this is 4n. That's become n squared plus 4n. Why is it 4n plus 4n? What? It's 1 times n squared. No, uh, I'm asking for loop to load. Yes. I said for loop, just take it one. Okay, so one. No, the first one is one times n. The second is one times n. 
okay and the second one is there is one statement one okay uh, even even if you have a constant we are talking about a stack even if you have a 3n square okay you want 3n square you mean the first one is 3n square or 3n square plus 3 Oh, statement two, yes. three, four, five. Yes. This counts as four n. What about the one for four root itself? You, you said four root is the one. Uh, okay. Four yes. Yes. So one for one for four root. Five n. Yes. Five n. Yes. Five n. Yes. We can put it five n. Yes. If we take the first for loop as one. Then we have statement two, statement three, statement four, and statement five. That will end five n. Okay. But this constant five or four will not affect the final result. Okay. What is the effect? The final result is having n square or n. Okay. You're going to see that later on. Okay. So now let us look about this statement. How many? A statement will be executed, let's say n capital is 10 or n capital is 1000. Okay? So if you look at the 6 n square and 20 n square, for n is greater or greater than 20, there is no difference if you multiply by 4 n or 5 n square, or if you multiply 6 n square times 20 square. So what is the point of this slide? Is actually constant with n squared is not make any difference even constant with n is not making a difference for very large n so here even if you look at this n times n plus 1 over 2 if we look at that as just n squared over 2 there's no difference there's no difference between n plus 1 over 2 times n or n squared plus n squared divided by 2. So if you draw them, maybe at the beginning, but if you draw them for very large n, you will almost identical. So what we are looking for here is we're looking to determine the performance of the algorithms or a method. And we have to focus on the dominant term inside the function that we create. You remember the function 3n plus 6? or 6 n square or 20 n square we need to look at this function after we calculate them and focus on the dominant terms the term that really matter for us that's where the big o notation is coming to the picture if you have two functions f of n and g of n they are both function of n where n is the size of the input we say that f of n is n o of g of n if we can find c constant and n zero some value some particular value some size of the input such that f of n is less than c g of n for all n is greater than n zero that is exactly in the graph so you have f of n and you have g of n you find n zero a certain point in the domain n0 and this point from this point and on for all n greater than n0 g of n is always greater than f of x or f of n as we see in this figure the blue line okay always greater than the red line which is f of n for all n greater than n0 okay sometimes we need to do constant shift we multiply g of n with constant so we guarantee that always c times g of n greater than f of n for a, that particular value now to compute the number of elementary operations we're going to assume all elementary operation going to take one unit of time how much this one unit of time i don't know maybe milli milliseconds maybe one second but all of them as one unit of time because we have different laptops different machine supercomputers if you take your algorithm run it on the supercomputer maybe you got five seconds but five seconds in the supercomputer mean five hour in your laptop okay so we're gonna assume all the elementary 
operation run as a one unit of time. So we need to be independent from the machine that you run your algorithm. We're going to give you the estimation, the time complexity of this algorithm independent from the machine that you're going to run in terms of the size of the input. All this elementary operation will be executed as one. This is in reality is not true. We know that because we have different machines, we have actually some instructions in some machine in milliseconds, some in milli milliseconds, some of them in one second, okay? But we're gonna go with this assumptions. Now, go back to the functions for the method contains. We end up with this function, f of n, three n plus six, constant three and constant six. Most likely they are not correct, yes? So here is the big all notations to describe the complexity of algorithms. Uh, we are not so much sensitive in terms of how many n, three or five, six. We need to focus on the dominant terms. So we use the big O notation to say that the complexity contains in the method, method contains is a O of n order of n. So why we say that? Because f of n okay, is less than c times less than g of n. We take the absolute value in case of we have the function is negative, but most of the time the function is not negative, but in case. Okay? So the order for time complexity for the contained method that we analyze, we say that is order of n. It's linear with the size of the input. If we increase the size of the input, the time complexity will be increased. That we're gonna, we should notice this, okay? Now, how we can derive this, how we can prove our claim. So we claim that three n plus six belong to order of n, or is a member of order of n. So we say that uh, if we take n is greater than one, so f of n will be greater than zero. You can see the function three n plus six for n is greater than one, okay? It will always be greater than zero and g of n is always greater than or equal to zero. Therefore, we can derive and try to find the constant. So we have three n plus six less than c of n for all n is greater than n zero. So we take six, we convert three n plus six is actually less than nine n. If we put n here, that's become three n plus six n, which is less than six n. That's true. So three of n plus six is less than nine n, okay, for all n is greater than one. So the function of n is a member of O of n. Now, we can look at this proof from different point, okay? We can say we're gonna divide this f of n divided by g of n to simplify the job. So we can have three of n plus six of n plus six divided by n less than c. Now you can see here how the transformation from the left side to the right side. So we start with three n plus six, okay, in numerator, then we make it three n plus six n. Absolutely, three n plus six n is greater than three n plus six. Now, we group these together to become nine n divided by nine, and that is less than nine. This is how we figure the constant c. So we say that three n plus six is less than nine n, for all n is greater than one, and we say f of n, the function, the time complexity of the contained method is a member of O of n. Now, for the second proof, we use this fact, okay, which is f of n divided by g of n, and we try to find c, which is the constant. And this, keep this in mind, that one is less than n n is less than n squared, n squared is less than n to the power three, and so on. Now, if we have that, I would like you to prove that this function, f of n, 
3 n square minus n plus 100 is a member of O of n square. So, the time complexity, we have some a certain method. We calculate the time complexity for this method by counting the elementary operations and how many times this elementary operation is going to run. We end with this function, 3 n square minus n plus 100. And the claim is saying that this 3 n minus n plus 100 is a member of O of n square. So, the time complexity is a quadratic time complexity. So, if the size of the input is increased by 2, the running time will be increased by 2 to the power 2. That's mean 4. Okay? So, we take n, let us choose n 0 is equal to 1. So, we start this process. Okay? This is the transformation process until we find the constant c. So, we take the absolute value of numerator and denominators. We change minus to plus. Then we make in everything n square to get rid of denominators. We end up with 104. So we say that this is the time complexity. Now, if I ask you this example, you want to carry n items from one room to another room. How many operation you need? n times 2n n factorial no you need n pickup you need n forward movement then n drops then n reverse direction that for n okay so any operations okay that's 4n will be c times n. 4 is not important. As you mentioned, most of you, order of n. That is the most important things. So that's similar to any process that we're going to access the memory. If you want to go access the array and read the element from the array, that is the same thing. So any access to the array, it's order of n. Yes. Yes, what we will be, even we give uh, approximation for the time complexity. We say this is a linear time complexity. As the n of input is increased, the run time will be increased. How much the run time? You have to take the algorithm and fix the machine. Most of the people doing research in literatures, they publish that if they need to compare based on the run time, the actual run time, they fix the machine. They say, we run it on the CPU until something, this is the name, this is the, and we run it with this RAMs, with this kind of multiprocessing algorithm implementation. Then we give the time in seconds, okay? But if we need to find the time complexity for the algorithm, we don't need to be that much precise. We give approximation, order of n, order of n squares, logarithmics, quadratic exponentials, okay? All of these give us an indication how much the time will be, but how much exact I have to run and find it out. Okay? So that is similar. If you read an input from the users, that's minimum is order of n. Keep that in your mind. Okay? Now, we have these categories. We have constant, order of 1, or order of k. They are constant of k. We have a logarithmic, order of log of n. O of n, linear. We have n times log of n, which is greater than from n. Okay? That's n log of n. We have linear logarithmic, and we have a quadratic. We have cubic. We have n to the power k, which is the polynomial, where k is a constant. And we have k to the power n, which is a very fast growing time complexity. We don't need it. Your algorithm is running as exponential time complexity. It's running not very fast, very slow. Okay? This is the numbers to give you an idea, to make a sense about the time. If you have n, the size of input is 8. Let's say you want to sort an array, and your algorithm, your algorithm was logarithmic time complexity, then you need three operations three unit of time, okay, let's say, three unit of time. If it's linear, that means you need eight unit of time. 
if it's in linear logarithmic, which is you need 24 unit of time, even for eight elements to sort them, let's say. Then if it's a quadratic, you need 64 unit of time. If it's a cubic, you need 512 unit of time. If it's exponential, look how many unit of time you need. You need 256. As n is increased from 8 to 16, look how many exponential you need. You need 65,000 around unit of time. So the exponential is growing very, very fast. The last column. Linear, logarithmic is the best one. Very, okay? Even if you have 256 elements, you want to sort them, and your algorithm is logarithmic time complexity, you need only eight operations. Now, let us go uh, for each one of them, revisit them. So order of one, describe the algorithm that's run with a constant of time. We say order of n, okay? Or order of one, sorry. Order of one is a constant of time. Running time does not depend on the size of input. There is no n in big O. So one means independent of time. The same thing here we got get from array list or contain inside the hash set. These operations, example for order of one, with constant time. Check the number if it's even or odd. Get from array list. You give me the index, I will retain the value for you. A hash set contains this value or not, this test. This is a constant time. Log rhythmic, which is the runtime that is proportional to logarithm of the size of this input, which is called logarithmic complexity, like binary search. If you give me the sorted array and you want to look for the element inside the sorted array, that's a logarithmic okay, time complexity. Contains inside a tree set. Not hash set, tree set. Contains is actually logarithmic time complexity. This is to imagine what's the difference between logarithmic and constant. So if you have the size of input is 2 to the power 60, log of n, that is 60. So even if you have a big data as the size of universe, you can only run your algorithm and find whatever you're looking for in 60 unit of time. Okay, Very fast compared to the other, for example, linear. This is an example for a logarithmic time complexity. You have the sorted array is given to you, and you are looking for an element inside sorted array. You check for the 25. You divide every time. You check for the k in the middle. If it's less than the middle, you're going to focus on the left side. If it's greater than the middle, you're going to focus on the right side every time. So each time you cut it with O order of 1. Then you have sizes, n, then n over 2, n over 4, n over 1, until you have the element that you are looking for, or you might find no element at that location. <coughs> so it's a log of n, okay? Which is, means the number of bits inside n binary, okay? So this binary search for the sorted array is a logarithmic time complexity. This is an example here. It's Telling you that the binary search, uh, the search, if the array is sorted, okay? You can see here, you can search inside the value, you give me the array, and you give me the value, I search, but the array should be sorted, or I can search even between two indices. You give me two indices, and this is the functionality inside the utility class called arrays. Now, let us look at this one. The one thing about the binary search is retain the index where the element is, should be found. In the first array, we have array A, and we try to look for all the elements inside the array, 16 elements, and we give 42, we're going to back 10. Where is the, actually the index of 42? We retain 10. Now, if we give 21, 21 is not exist in the array. We try to divide the array until we find the element inside the array, we're going to have minus 7. Where is the supposed 24 to P inside minus 1? Order of N is a linear time complexity. Example of linear time complexity, 
you try to find the minimum or the maximum value inside the array or a list. You have unsorted array or a list, and you try to find the minimum and the maximum of that array. Contains inside unsorted array. That is the d difference between the linear and constant time. Let's say you have the linked list here, and you try to find the end of the linked list. How are you going to do that? You're going to walk through all the elements of the linked list until you reach the end. So the first element point to the second element until you find the last one is point to null. So that is the, your last element. So the time complexity is the number of the record inside the linked list, which is order of n. Now, if you want to insert in the front of that linked list, how many time you need? How many unit of time? You need n operations, the size of n? No. You need actually a constant time. You need actually four operations to insert inside the front of that array, linked list. So if you have a linked list and you want to insert in the front of the linked list, I don't need to run operations or based on the size of the input. It's independent from the size of the input. I will go to the first element on the linked list and then insert in the side the first element. That's in the front of the linked list. So it will have constant time. Now, this is a sequential search. You have the for loop. You look for the element inside this array. Okay? If the element is found, you're going to return it. Okay? That is inside. This is order of n. That's time complexity. Okay? On average, you will have n over 2. So that's 1 over 2, which is a constant. We can ignore it. Okay? Now, n log of n, which is a linear logarithmic time complexity, is an inefficient sorting of array or a list. You have algorithms that sort array of list inefficient that will end up with linear logarithmic time complexity. Order of n square, which is the quadratic time complexity. Okay? Inefficient sorting of array or a list. Also, check if every thing in one list, in another list. You have two lists, list one, list two. You want to check that of all the elements inside the list one, inside the list two. That's time complexity of order of n squared. Order of n to the power, two to the power n, which is the exponential time. Here is really the time complexity is very, you have to avoid design such kind of algorithms that end up with exponential time complexity, okay? Like trying to break the combinations of a lock by trying all the possible combinations, okay? This is an example of the exponential time complexity. If you have the input of size 60, so the time complexity will be 2 to the power 60. That's around 2 to the power 10 to the power 60, which is 124 to the power 6, which is, you can think about it, is 10 to the power 3 approximate to the power 6, which is around the age of the universe in seconds. Okay? That's why we try, whenever we design our algorithm, to avoid that exponential time complexity. This is a figure to give you a, a view where if you give you this graph and I ask you to label which time complexity one of these. You can see this can be considered as a linear. This is n log of n. Okay? This is n squared and this is 2 to the power n. The time complexity exponential which is a very fast growing in terms of the size of the input. Some comment about the big O. Complexity tells us something about the running time of the algorithm in terms of the size of the input. Never be exact. We cannot find the exact running time in milliseconds or in seconds. It's just give us an, an overview about how much the time complexity of your algorithm in terms of order of n. Okay? By focusing on the uh, uh, dominant terms inside the time complexity functions. Now, if you have very, the size of the input is very small, 
there is no difference between very efficient or very inefficient algorithm. You saw in the table, the exponential was less than n to the power 3 for n is equal to 8. If you take n is equal to 8, the exponential need 256, while the n to the power 3 need 500, okay, which is very less. So, if the size of the input is very small, there is no difference between inefficient or efficient. You have to look for big n. Now, this is very important. We say that 3n squared plus 17 is n order of n squared. What we mean by that is a member inside this group of n squared. In O of n squared is represent a group of functions. 3n squared plus 17 is a member of that group. Okay? We can say this. 3n squared plus 17 is order of n squared. Or you can say 3n squared plus 17 equal O of n squared. You can say 3n squared plus 17 a member belong. This means a member or a belong to of order of n. But you cannot say order of n squared is equal 3n squared plus 17. You cannot have order of n squared to the left side, always to the right side. Okay? You can say members, you can say 3n squared plus 17 equal order of n squared. But you cannot say order of n squared is equal to 3n squared plus 17. Remember this. Okay? Because the time complexity big O represents an approximation for your function. You cannot say big O is actually this function. This function belongs to big O squared or belongs to n or logarithmic of n. Now, how we can prove function example like this. Someone tell us that n squared plus 42n plus 7 is equal order of n squared. How we can prove it? There is a step. We start with n squared plus 42n plus 7. We move all n to n squared, make everything n squared. The maximum power in this function is what? n squared. So you move all n, or here 7, you can think about it 7 times n to the power 0. So we raise all the power to the maximum one. So here we have n squared plus 42, n squared plus 7, n squared, a greater n a greater than 1, which is 50, n squared. So we say that n squared plus 42, n plus 7 is less than 50, n squared, which is a proof that this n squared plus 42, n plus 7 is equal to order of n squared, or as a member of n squared, or is m o, o squared, for c is equal to 50 and n0 is greater than 1. Let's say I give you this one. 5n log n plus 8n minus 200. And I will ask you to prove it. It's actually order of n log n. How are we going to do this? Take half a minute or a minute. Try to do it in your pencil and paper. So we'll start putting everything as log of n. You can see here there is a negative sign. We replace it to the positive sign. Okay? And we get rid of 200. We don't need 200. Okay? So, of course, 5n log n plus 8n minus 200 is less than 5n log n plus 800. Now, we have 5n log n is actually plus 8n less than 5n log n plus 8n log n. 
because n less than n log n for all n is greater than 2. Why 2? Because log of n is always greater than 1. Okay? Then you end up with 13 n log of n and that is the constant that you are looking for. You can say that 5 n log of n plus 8 n minus 200 is actually order of n log of n for c is equal to 13 and n 0 is equal to 2. Now, selection sort, while you are, have some unsorted elements and you would like to sort the elements, so look at this array. You have did part of the job, so you have 13, 16, 21. They are already in the place, but you have other part of the array is unsorted. What we are going to view here in this slide is the fourth iteration of this loop. So you're going to go, take the smallest one, okay? So 45 is the smallest one right now. So we're going to try to compare all the elements in this array. We are doing for loop until we find the smallest one. Now we find 36. 36 is less than 45. We replace the smallest element. We continue. Until we find the smallest one, we find 22. 22 is less than 36. So we replace the smallest one, 22, and then we continue inside the array, and that is the smallest one. Now we're going to do the swap. We're going to replace 47, 40, sorry, 45 with 22. This is the, called the selection sort. Really example, this I do, just demonstrated to you, one iteration. This is one iteration which is the fourth iteration. Okay? If I ask you, what do you think about the time complexity of this one? Let us see. This is the implementation. We can see here we have four loop. We take the array. We take the four loop for all the elements inside the array to pick the smallest. Then once we pick the smallest, we go again for another for loop, but from j is equal to i plus 1. Okay? And then we try to compare to find all the elements until we find the smallest one. And we use compare two to find that. Once we find the smallest one, we're going to do the swap. That's exactly what I demonstrated in the previous slide. I just represented here on Java code. Okay? Now, this will be executed as n times n plus minus one divided by two. So how we did this and how calculate this? So we have the, this will be evaluated n minus 1, this n minus 1 times, this loop will be evaluated n times n minus 1 over 2, okay? And this will be executed n times n minus 1 over 2, and the smallest one, how many times we can execute it? Think about it. Let us go here. How many times we're going to execute the swap? n minus 1. This will be n minus 1. This will be n minus 1. By doing all the calculation and look and focus on the dominant terms, so we will have 4 times n minus 1 for the outer loop, and inner loop is 4 times n minus, n minus 1 over 2, and this will end up with the cost function as 1 plus c times n minus 1 plus k of n times n minus 1 over 2 in the worst case. Okay? Imagine in the worst case, all the element on the array are not on the right positions. So no part of the array is sorted. Okay? That's the worst case. Now, we talk about a logarithmic time or a, a quadratic time, sorry, when we say that we need to check if sub array is actually contains inside another array. Here we have the sub and super and we need to make sure that all element inside sub is inside super otherwise we're going to retain false to the user. So here we have sub set. We give the subset and then the superset and we ask if the subset is inside the superset. All the elements inside the first set also occurs on the second subset. So, 
Let us see. In this case, we're going to return false to the user because 5 is not uh, exist. But let us do this by using this helper method, which is a member. We send x, okay, and we send the array. We look inside the array if this element is exist, like contains. So we have to go for loop inside all element inside the array. If the x is equal any one of these elements, we're going to return true. So this will run for a, which is a dot length, which is the n times. So the time complexity for this algorithm members is actually k times n plus c, some constant. So it's order of n. Now, what about this one? Now this is the implementation for the subset. We look for all elements inside the superset, and we check if not a member, we take the element, and look inside the superset. If not, we're going to retain false. Here we demonstrate the time complexity that is related to another function. You see here in this, you might see one loop. You say, oh, order of n. You end up, you finalize your answer, you put the multiple choice. This time complexity here is order of n. You didn't pay attention that inside this if statement, you are actually calling another function where in the previous slide we calculate the time complexity for this function is also order of n. So you actually you have similar situation like nested for loops. Okay? Here we have the order time complexity for this one is m is a sub length and n is the length of the super length. That will end n times m. If n times m is the same, so the time complexity for all this algorithm is actually n squared which is the quadratic. Here, I want you to always be careful if the method is calling another method, is the function is calling another function. Here we saw that to check the element inside this subset, all of them is exist in the other set, we have to create a helper method to help us to do this job. But that doesn't mean we reduce the time complexity. No, the time complexity is still in square. Still we need to do two nested for loops, okay? We're not breaking out the time complexity because in each element, we're gonna go back to the helper method and check if this element inside this array or not. If it's not, we're gonna retain false to the users. So, it's good always to look at the all the application, not only focus on the, for, for example here, <coughs> sorry, don't focus on this one and say, okay, I will look at the time complexity of subset. What is the time complexity here? Oh, I have only one for loop. Quickly, I will see the multiple choice. It's order of n. No. Here is the, inside the for loop, you are calling another function, which is, has the time complexity order of n. So the time complexity can multiply for each other. I just show you in the slide for the completeness and comprehensive, all the detailed study, how we got n squared, okay? You can look at it at home, and if you have any questions, you can ask me, okay? Remember that we are trying here to find the growth of time complexity in terms of the size of the input. We're not going to specifically give you the number. This algorithm will run 10 seconds. This algorithm will run 5 seconds. No, we're going to give you an approximation. This, algor this algorithm run with a quadratic time, order of n squared. This algorithm run of linear time squared, order of n. So that's what we are trying to do. n squared is a quadratic order of one is a constant time. Okay? So if you want to analyze the actual time, you have to go to the algorithm and analyze the execution time in seconds. And you have to, that's related and depend on the clock cycles of your CPU, how much fast, 2.5 gig or 3.2 gig. That will make a lot of difference. Multi-threading is implemented. Multi-threading at a CPU level or multi-threading at a software levels. All these factors are going to affect you. Okay? All this, that is all for today.